This special aeronautics and space report brought to you by NASA. To a casual observer, it appeared to be another perfect launch. 63 seconds after liftoff, however, an apparent mechanical failure caused a micrometeoroid and thermal shield to be torn away. That, in turn, caused one of the solar panels to come off and jam the other. What followed was an all-out government industry effort to save the crippled Skylab 1 space station. The end result? An umbrella-like shield to cool the workshop and a repair of the solar panel by the crew. Mr. William Schneider, Skylab Program Director. Well, the uh, solution to our problems was obviously the, the product of a great deal of team effort by a great number of people who put in long hours and worked very hard and uh, were very ingenious. Uh, it was a NASA-wide effort and indeed an, a NASA and an industry-wide effort. Uh, there were suggestions and solutions were proposed by people all over. And uh, it was very gratifying to watch the aerospace industry and NASA come to grips with this problem and come up with a solution. Astronaut Rusty Schweikert is just one of the hundreds of people who helped solve the problem. Schweikert spent many, many hours underwater simulating techniques for fixing the solar panel. In the underwater simulation, we, we then wanted to demonstrate three different capabilities. We, we wanted to show that we could uh, pry the strap off using a cinch bar or a, a pinch bar that we had on board the spacecraft already. And we demonstrated that capability. The next thing we demonstrated was the capability to cut through the strap using a very small device uh, that's stowed in the onboard dental kit called a bone saw. And this bone saw fits very nicely on the thumbs of the glove and you slip it underneath the, the aluminum strap and then just cut through it with a back and forth motion. So we demonstrated that and then finally we demonstrated that just by tightening up further on the cutters, uh, the large cutters that we had at the end of the 25 foot pole, that we could also cut through the strap using those cutters. And we were able to demonstrate underwater all three techniques so that we had high confidence that the crew would be able to get the job done using one or more of, of those demonstrated techniques. Now that the repairs have been made, and if all goes as planned, astronauts Alan Bean, Owen Garriott, and Jack Lausma will soon be launched toward the still-in-orbit Skylab space station. They will be residing there for up to 56 days, man's longest stay in the weightless environment of space. 41-year-old Navy Captain Alan L. Bean will be in command of the Skylab 3 mission. Raised in Fort Worth, Texas, Bean helped explore the moon during Apollo 12. Our mission is essentially uh, has three objectives. The first is a uh, is study of man himself. So one of the things that we're doing on our mission for 56 days, and that's the reason it is that length, is to take a look at how man himself survives up there in that lack of gravity condition. Uh, secondly, we want to look at the Earth. What can man do in Earth orbit to uh, make it a better place for man on the street? Not only today, but next year, uh, 10 years from now, 20 years from now. We've only uh, scratched the surface uh, with the uh, resources problem that we're going to experience on this planet in the coming years. This is a definitely a, a tool that's going to be used in the future. This is a, also something that's just in its infancy. We don't know exactly how much can be done from space, but we know it will be. So we're going to study the Earth with some instruments. Last, we're going to take a look at the sun. And we all know that the sun is probably the most important body as far as we're concerned, because everything that we have here on Earth in the form of energy, heat, fuel, anything else came from the sun or it comes from the sun at this moment. We want to understand better how it works. There's many, many uh, uh, occurrences, uh, heat transfer uh, phenomena, that if we could understand how it occurred on the sun would probably help us in our efforts now to harness the atom and make it better useful for peaceful purposes. While most of the results of the first Skylab mission are still being processed, astronaut Bean did make these observations. I think one of the most important things that we've learned as far as crew operations are concerned, and I think this affects then every single thing we do in a space station, is the ease with which 
uh, man has been able to move about the space station. He's been able to move rapidly. He's been able to affix himself to one position so that he could work experiments, so that he could perform uh, uh, housekeeping functions. He's been able to uh, move large boxes, uh, some weighing several hundred pounds precisely, without breaking his fingers, without bumping them into the wall, and put them just where he wanted them to be. Essentially, we found out that man, in a large volume, can operate very efficiently. Now, going on the theory that space stations and space vehicles will become larger as time progresses, just as the modern aircraft carrier came from the canoe, we're going to find that we're going to continue to occupy larger and larger volumes. And this is an indicator that man has got, is going to be able to, to live with, with that idea in mind. Well, I'm a so-called pilot on this mission. And, uh, Astronaut Jack Lausma from Grand Rapids, Michigan, is the second of the Skylab 3 crewmen. Lausma is 37 years old. Command module, the environmental control, electrical power systems, communications, and so forth. Once we get to the Skylab, our jobs are pretty much the uh, same. We're not too specialized. I'll participate in the uh, solar physics uh, experiments and medical experiments in the Earth resources. Uh, however, I do have some specialty areas in the event that we have problems with the systems on board the Skylab or systems problems with the Earth resources equipment. But by and large, we've trained to the point now where uh, most anybody can handle any job once we get up there in orbit. Jack Lausma is especially interested in the Earth resources experiments. By looking down from space with remote sensors, we can tell much about what's on the ground. Uh, each object on the ground has its own electromagnetic radiation, which is collected by a sensor on board. And we can tell, for example, uh, the difference between barley and oats and corn and different kinds of crops. We can tell those that are diseased from those which are well. We can tell different kinds of trees from one another. We can see fresh water as opposed to polluted water, or we can see air pollution as opposed to clean air. There are many things that we can see from space with a sensor. And this will permit us to inventory our crops and resources better. It'll permit us to therefore manage them in a better way. And in addition, we can look at soils. We can uh, look at uh, snow packs. We can, we can look at the oceans to see where the uh, best shipping routes are or where the most fish are likely to be. There's a host of applications of Earth resources, many of which are uh, just now coming out of the woodwork and which we're finding as a result of our studies in this area. A piece of experimental equipment the crew will evaluate is shown here during ground simulations. Lausma explains its use. We have on board the Skylab uh, two maneuvering units, uh, one of which is the type that Buck Rogers might have strapped on his back years ago in the comic strips. Essentially, it's a way to maneuver around in space uh, in a free-floating area without hanging on to anything and to go from one thing to another. The purpose on Skylab is to evaluate this kind of a uh, flying device to see if we can uh, use it in later applications in space. I'm confident that if we had, had, if we had developed this kind of maneuvering unit for the Skylab, why we would have been able to accomplish our EVAs more readily. I'm sure that uh, we couldn't have been more successful than we were, but it would have enabled us to do a better job. We can strap this flying backpack onto us and control it by little jet thrusters with hand controllers and go from one point in the Skylab to another point. And then if you extend your imagination to flying from one spacecraft to another, or from a spacecraft to a satellite to repair it, or some of those other kinds of applications, you can see the advantage of having a backpack or a maneuvering unit, which is operated by one man. We expect that uh, on Skylab, we'll get the information that we need to develop a backpack that can actually be used operationally in later space applications. 42-year-old Dr. Owen Garriott from Enid, Oklahoma, is the third member of the Skylab 3 crew. He is designated science pilot and holds a doctorate degree in electrical engineering from Stanford University, where he once taught. We asked him to discuss some of the things learned from the first Skylab mission that will be helpful on this second manned flight. There are a number of things that we already know on the ground today uh, that uh, will be very important to us in our planning for mission two. Uh, the Harvard College Observatory instrument sends all of its data to the ground uh, via telemetry. It's all an electronic uh, scanning scheme. 
and we've already got pictures of the sun uh, built up at several dozen wavelengths, all the way uh, from uh, short wavelengths at 300 angstroms up to 1300 angstroms in wavelength. We see the sun at these differing wavelengths. We know what sort of features are visible, uh, what sort of features are suppressed. Uh, we know what sort of targets we can point at and so on. And so our planning is already underway as to how to take advantage of this information and has already been returned. Now in the area of physiology, for example, we have the information back at this time as to how the uh, men's reactions, uh, pedaling the bicycle and in response to the uh, lower body negative pressure device, this uh, system which pulls a partial vacuum on the lower half of your body. We already know how uh, the uh, body is responding to these things and so uh, we are in fact modifying the protocol, the procedures that we go through to uh, pedal the bicycle a little bit differently than we had planned before and uh, pedal it in a way which makes us a little more efficient in transferring the energy which we produce into the uh, torque delivered to the bicycle pedals. So there are a number of ways uh, that we are already working on uh, alterations to our program based upon what the Mission 1 crew has found. Student experiments, experiments submitted by youngsters from high schools throughout the U.S., will continue to be carried out and observed by the Skylab 3 crew. Dr. Garriott described one of them. The in vitro immunology experiment is a very interesting student experiment and the uh, investigator, the student investigator here is from New York, Mr. Todd Meister, who is a very enthusiastic young fellow who has spent a great deal of time in the preparation of this experiment and is a very competent uh, young man indeed. Uh, his experiment uh, will involve the interaction of antigens and antibodies in a uh, matrix of material. Uh, we will allow it to incubate uh, for something like 24 hours and then photograph the experiment. And from the uh, degree in which, uh, to which the uh, antibodies have reacted with the antigen, uh, he will be able to determine whether or not there has been any zero-G effect. And uh, this has important implications, I think, uh, relative to uh, studying diseases or the body's mechanism for fighting disease. And uh, several other potential applications, I'm sure, could also be uh, 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 at least imagined. And so I think it's one of the most interesting experiments and uh, one for which the student investigator has certainly been very well prepared. The crew of the second manned Skylab mission is finishing out its last days of intensive training before launch. Summarizing and then looking toward the future, Owen Garriott had this to say. Only in the last few weeks, in uh, the time of Skylab, have we really begun to exploit and see the potential of man operating in the near-Earth environment. We can see that it is possible for man to fix things in space. We can see that it is possible to live for long uh, uh, intervals in space at more or less normal uh, living circumstances and in a normal living environment. And once we see, as we are doing now in Skylab, that these things are possible, then we can begin to appreciate better all of the things that it is possible to do from this vantage point far above the Earth's surface. And I believe the potential and the implications and the extrapolation of what we now have is really so vast that it takes a man with a very uh, good ability to foresee the future to even uh, guess at the many ways in which it will affect our lives. I think it could even have an impact on our methods of uh, energy uh, usage in our country because we have a vast amount of energy available to us from the sun uh, over uh, all we have to do is to figure out the most economical and efficient means of collecting it. And I do think that there is potential uh, for the collection of solar energy from space uh, to be used for the sort of tasks we find it necessary to be used in here at home. So. Uh, uh, the, Man will have to participate in all these things from the way of putting them into proper operation, maintaining and operating these devices. So I think we're on the very threshold of really an enormous new uh, undertaking that uh, very few people uh, uh, can properly envisage. This special report brought to you by NASA, the National Aeronautics and Space Administration.